Are you excited about uh, James Webb Space Telescope and other telescopes in the future that uh, increase the resolution and the precision of uh, what can be detected out there? Absolutely. Um, JWST is, is fantastic already. I am not planning to use it personally, although I think I'm on one or two observing proposals, actually, because similar to what we already spoke about, we're interested in the same thing. We're just kind of looking at a different sides of the fence, mm -hmm. right? I have my my old surviving stars and I concoct these little stories about what the earliest galaxies may have looked like, what what the objects were that contributed, you know, energy and, and elements and all these things. And uh, my JWST colleagues, they try to detect some of these earliest photons from these earliest systems to uh, look at the energetics and, and other things, you know, what was there, how many these kinds of things, right? So together we're trying to to explore this first billion years, but we do it in very complementary ways. And so I'm I'm very excited to to see what what they can come up with and how that helps me to inform my stories better and more comprehensively. Uh, what do you think is the future of the of, of the field of stellar archaeology? How much can we Maybe what are the limits of our, our understanding of this first billion years of our universe? Um, well, obviously, lots of limitations in the sense that I always say, I have a metal poor star for any of your questions. <laughs> 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 Because there are so many different kinds out there. Um, and we still find new patterns sometimes, right? And there needs to be an explanation. The question is, Is it ultimately just one quirky star or is it two or is it three, right? Is it, is it a sample? Right. Is it a population? So we haven't concluded that kind of work yet. So every metal poor star is a kind of data point that you can use to improve the quality of your model of how yes. is the evolution of the early universe. Yes, yes. And I would say we're, we've made huge progress over the last 20 years. When I joined that field, it was in its infancy. And there was this serendipitous discovery of that first second generation star. And we have filled in the canvas a great deal since then. And this is what I have greatly enjoyed about doing so, because there was so much discovery potential. And it's been it's been dying down a little bit because of all the progress. Mm -hmm. Um It's gonna, it's gonna, it's on on the up and coming again because there's so many large spectroscopic surveys in the works now that will just provide a different level of data that we haven't had before. I'm sort of of these older generation. I have only very few colleagues. I work in small teams, and I observe every single star myself. <laughs> that you know, I whatever I can, I do myself. I don't. T generally take other people's data, at least uh, not certainly not in the end stage. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a big data kind of person, although we all headed that, that way. I, I certainly use uh, data from the Gaia um, astrometric satellite for the kinematics, for example. But that's um, personally a new thing for me to, to use sort of big sky surveys um, that are available. Um, so it's still very sort of hand-grown field, mm -hmm. you know, where we do our individual observations. Um, so, I have enjoyed that a lot, um, but that's about to change. So one star at a time. Yes. I mean, there's power to that, to build up intuition of the Absolutely. early universe by looking one star at a time. Yeah. And this is how you can really drill down on the questions that you have, right? Because you control what data you get. Um, otherwise, you have the data that you have, right? You get what you get and you don't get upset. <laughs> uh, I don't like that. I'm a little bit snobby. I, I really like to formulate my questions, go to the telescope, and then come what may, I will, I will try to get it. And also develop the intuition of where the data can be relied upon and where it can't and all the different quirks of the data and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Sometimes a lot is lost in the aggregation of the noisy data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's always the danger if you have someone else's data that you just don't really understand the, you know, the limitations, completeness things, how certain things were set up and you know, you get out what you put in. So I'm I'm really particular about that and it certainly paid off for me. That's one of the main notions that I try to teach in my classes and to my my students that you need to be able to formulate your quest question really well because otherwise you're going to get an answer to a different question, but you won't notice that it ha that the goalpost has shifted in the meantime, right? So your interpretation can only be as good as the question. If you need to change your question, that's cool. 
do it. But then, you know, it needs to pair up with your interpretation again. And so knowing, really being in the know about every step of what happens, that leads to quality results, I think. That's why I have sometimes little trouble with, with sort of big data and statistical analysis. Yes, on average, that's true. Um, I'm not debating that. But I, I'm the kind of person I like to look at the outliers, so not the bulk, but you know, the special ones. Yeah. And they just need to be treated in a different way. And there needs to be an acknowledgement of that, different ways for different things. So uh, um, big data can look at uh, divorce rates. And uh, perhaps you and I are more interested in the individual love stories. Yes, <laughs> that, that works for me. Um, so uh, I don't know if it's possible to say, but what do you think is the big discoveries that are waiting? Uh, is it on the different dynamics of the yield? Uh, the common narrative, the common story of how some of these uh, metal poor stars are formed? Is it Where are the discoveries in this field that you think will come? I think the individual discoveries are actually, we've made most of those, certainly through individual stars. Um Finding yet another second generation star is incredibly important for me, but isn't isn't really going to move the needle. Finding 50 of them or 100 of them, that would move the needle, but that's in order or, or two magnitudes up. And um, new search techniques and new uh, surveys may enable that, but would you still call that a discovery? Right. So that's just so, a scale. That's a scale. Thing. Yes. So I think about it more like literally of the puzzle. Let's say you have a thousand piece puzzle and you know you have 900 pieces in there. If you're a person like me, I want to get to the last ones. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to leave it. It's like, okay, I see broadly what this is going to mm -hmm. look like. Right. I I'm done now. No, I want to get to the last one. <laughs> so is the picture globally going to change? No. Are we going to figure out all the details and how it really works? Yes, right. So really carefully getting detail map into out it the the ancient uh, yeah. the ancient stars of our universe. Yeah, because I think that's what many of us scientists are a <laughs> little little bit detailed obsessed. But I think sure. that's that's our job too, right? Mm -hmm. To really kind of make it airtight, to really walk away saying, "I fully understand this," not just broadly. But, you know, I really know, we really know now. And so more and more of that is going to happen. Um, and so I think this is probably true across astronomy. These individual 10 sigma discoveries become less and less. If they were easy, we would have made them already, right? Which means we have made many of them. Um, but really filling in the details is 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 the next sort of level of discovery. Maybe we need to find a new word for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. the, the hopes and expectations that go along with the word discovery are so enormous. We we may not always be able to live up to that. Um, but it doesn't mean that we're not finding out new things. It's mm -hmm. just a different kind of quality because the questions have shifted. You close one door, suddenly there are 10 new open doors that that we want to explore and march through. And that's the, you know, finding these last puzzle pieces here and there that really make it airtight. And so there's a lot of value and a lot of power and beauty to the discovery in the big picture of our universe and in the details. Yes. So bo both are We really need both, important. absolutely. 